Thank you, Rachel. And uh, well, good afternoon. And as always, it's uh, a pleasure to contribute to the Friday lunchtime talk. And um, today I'm here to talk about new acquisitions. Now, over the last three years, and despite the difficulties inherent to the pandemic, the Hunterian was fortunate to be in a position to acquire these two Scottish paintings to complement its existing holding of late 18th and early 19th century Scottish art. Both were acquired with the help of grants from the Art Fund and the National Fund for Acquisitions and the Alexander and Margaret Johnson Endowment Fund. And I can't stress enough how without those funds, we really wouldn't be in a position to acquire paintings of that caliber to the collection. So we're very grateful to them, of course. Now in the next 25 minutes or so, I intend to briefly provide an overview of the existing collections within the universities that these two paintings have come to join and to explore some of the stories they allow us to tell. And I have to warn you, this is a real ramble, so uh, bear with me. Um, so Scottish landscape has, also, has of course been one of the principal subjects for native object, uh, for native artists for centuries, but it is in this period going from the mid 18th century to the first three decades of the 19th century, free for the first time in a long time of religious or civil wars in Scotland, that these artists started to focus on landscape with a new frame of mind, born out of a wider cultural drive to celebrate and rediscover in some ways Scotland. Artists, writers and poets, and here of course Sir Walter Scott and Robert Burns come to mind in particular, they all contributed to the emergence of Scotland's modern national identity, and the landscape painted in that period played an important role in redefining this identity. Um, and this is really where those two paintings sit, in my opinion. <clears throat> now, the Hunterian represents this period through around 300 relevant works, mostly works on papers um, that are complemented by 12 paintings. And I've just put a very small selection on the screen here, which has some kind of relevance to the two paintings that have entered our collection recently. And you can see in the top left corner, for example, there's a view of Rosin Castle by uh, Thompson of Donningston, and underneath is a view of Craig Miller Castle by Reverend Toma, Edward Thomas Daniel. Um, and then again, underneath, to, still on your left, you have a view of the Trossachs um, and Loch Catherine by Francis Nicholson. And on the top right corner, um, a view by Alexander Naismith of Dumbarton. Um, and I included Naismith here because he's considered in, in many ways the father of Scottish landscape. So it's quite interesting to have those two paintings by Moore and by um, Knox joining the collection to complement it. And then underneath is John Knox and Nelson Monument struck by lightning, which is the only other Knox painting that we have in the collection. Um, Another area of the collection of the university collection that should not be underestimated is the archive and special collection, which is kept um, in the um, library, university library next door to the Hunterian Art Gallery, and is a real treasure trove, really. Um, and in there, there are over 40 illustrated um, publications linked to travel in Scotland in that period um, and associated literature. And those really add considerably to our representation of Scottish landscape from that period. And again, I've, I'm just giving you a very quick snapshot of what you could find if you ventured up the stairs or take the elevator all the way up to the 12th level of the university library. And in the top, left corner, we have um, a publication by Edmund Burt, um, which takes the forms of letters uh, that contain descriptions of um, the Highlands um, when um, he was there as a, an English rent collector for the forfeited Scottish estates after the Jacobat rising of 1715. So it's a real unique insight um, into Scotland at the time. And the six plates that it includes give a, an idea of how an English visitor would see Scotland and, and what they would pick on. Uh, surprise, surprise, here you can see that there are uh, two uh, castles. The next uh, publication that I thought I would highlight is uh, by Thomas Pennant. It's on your right hand corner. Um, and um, Pennant was a naturalist, writer, and antiquarian, and his deep curiosity about the British past and present led him to undertake pioneering tours 
route through the British Isles, uh, which included uh, Scotland and Wales. He made two consecutive tours of Scotland. Uh, in 1769, he traveled on horseback with a single servant, and in a more extensive tour in 1772, he navigated the Western Isles by boat, accompanied, accompanied by a team of experts. His two published Scottish tours were the first to include a wide range of illustrations. Um, and in the 1772 volume, for example, there were over 90 plates. And here you can see a view from Tamas uh, that was included in that 1772. Uh, publication. Archive and Special Collection has a really good group of um, those tours um, by Pennant, both from 1769 and 1772. So there's about 15 of them, and every single one of them has a different number of illustrations. So they really provide an overview of what would be of interest in Scotland at the time for an English traveller such as Thomas Pennant. <coughs> The next publication I've included is in the bottom left corner and is by William Gilpin, who um, was an English writer, printmaker and clergyman, as well as a schoolmaster. And he's best known as one of the instigators of the principles behind the picturesque, an aesthetic ideal, which he defined as being halfway between the beautiful with its emphasis on smoothness, regularity, and order, and the sublime, which is all about vastness, magnitude, and intimations of power. The publication of Gilpin's tours had a considerable impact on picturesque touring in the Romantic period. His views on the charms of Scotland's untamed landscape influenced a new aesthetic appreciation of Highland landscape and sparked lively debates over the precise ingredients required for true picturesque beauty, often reflected in contemporary travel accounts and in art. And I think in some ways you can look at Gilpin and then think about those two acquisitions in an interesting way. And then the last one that I included is for a bit of fun. It's on the bottom right corner and it's a satire. It's called The Tour of Dr. Prosody in Search of the Antique and Picturesque Through Scotland, the Hebrides, the Orkney and Shetland Islands. And it was published in London in 1821. And it's really taking the mickey of all the people who have gone on tours of Scotland in the last 40 years, um, trying to find the most interesting antiquities, the most unusual um, Scottish tradition, um, and so on and so forth. And here you can see Dr. Prosody with his acolyte, who's just visiting the Falls of Clyde that that by the 1820s had become a really well-known touristic spot um, on the west of Scotland um, and coming into some kind of trouble because he's obviously losing his gripping and about to fall in the waterfall. <coughs> so those are just a few of the publications that can be found <coughs> in archive and special collection and really help um, our understanding of um, how people saw the Scottish landscape um, at the time. Now, for those of you interested in finding out more about this, um, what can be learned from looking at both, oops, I just pressed this with my elbow, uh, both uh, looking at paintings and prints and drawings and publications, um, and, and learn more about visual and written depiction of Scotland in that period, do check the exhibition online titled um, Old Ways New Road or the publication of the same title. They both offer a unique insight into the development of Scottish landscape painting in that period and explore how the Scottish landscape was variously documented, evaluated, planned and imagined in words and in images. Um, and in many ways, Jacob Moore's Needpath Castle and John Knox Mountain and Wooden Bridge in the Trossachs were both acquired as the exhibition was coming to life and are a, a legacy uh, of this project. So now on to Jacob Moore and his painting of Needpath Castle, which is dated around um, 1770. For those of you not too familiar with the artist, I thought I would just give you a quick recap as to who he was. <coughs> Moore was born in Edinburgh in 1740 and he trained as a painter. He also spent some time as an apprentice to a goldsmith and with a firm of decorative house painters, which were called the Norris. Um, he also attended the local um, Academy of Art in Edinburgh, the Trustees Academy, where his teacher were Alexander Rensman and William de la Cour. After cutting his teeth by painting scenery for Edinburgh theatres, Moore first came public recognition at home through theatre backdrops he executed for performances at the Theatre Royal in Edinburgh in around 1768-69. 
and it's encouraged by the success of these uh, theatre backdrops and by the growing support of local patrons that he was able to spend the next two years traveling extensively around the Scottish lowlands and further afield. There are some surviving drawings that suggest he went on several sketching expedition to well-known scenic locations. In the East, for example, he drew Arthur City in Edinburgh. He went to Roslyn, um, which is just about 20 minutes outside of Edinburgh, and Craig Miller, which is in the suburb of um, Edinburgh. He also went to Dunbar Castle in East Lothian, Needpass Castle, outside Peebles in the borders. And in the West, he ventured as far as the Falls of Clyde, near Lanark, Inveresk, the Trossachs, and Dumbarton Rock. So, quite an extensive uh, sketching tour. Now as a group, these drawings and sketches suggest Moore must have had in mind the example of his friend, Charles Stewart, whose reputation as a landscape painter in London was established through the exhibition of a series of paintings capturing locally celebrated beauty spots on the estate of his patron, particularly the Duke of Arthur in the second half of the 1760s. And this gives me an opportunity to share with you one of my favorite paintings at the Hunterian, uh, which is a view by Charles Sturrett of a waterfall dated 1765. Now, whilst most of, most of um, Charles Stewart's um, works are of named identified places, a waterfall is actually a composite view, bringing together elements uh, inspired by pictures of similar subjects um, that he executed for the Duke of Arthur. And with its low viewpoint and framing foreground foliage, its rustic stone bridge and its wild mountainous background, its fast running water falling into a deep gloomy pool. It anticipates a book for the sublime and the picturesque um, as Gilpin would, was busy developing at the same time as this painting was made. Um, and for this reason, I think it really is a rather interesting uh, uh, painting. Um, now, together with Stuart's views of his patron estate and, and, and this view of a waterfall, Moore's small number of landscape paintings born out of his travel through Scotland are among the very first celebrating Scotland's landscape as a worthy subject in their own right. And here I've gathered for you the four um, known um, views of Scotland that Moore executed. Um, around that time. Um, and you can see um, in the bottom um, right corner, that view of Needpass Castle and then the views of the Falls of Clyde that really made uh, Moore's reputation um, in Britain. Um, he exhibited some of those views of the Falls of Clyde in London in 1771 and they did bring him considerable acclaim. They also um, allowed him um, to raise funds in order to travel to Italy and um, after a few months, um, he was able to leave for Rome, where his reputation, uh, reputation preceded him. And he then went on to become a well-known landscape painter in um, achieving a, a European reputation as more of Rome. Um, so never ready to come back to Scotland after that. Um, but what of Needpass Castle specifically, might you ask? Well, we know very little so far of the story behind the painting's early provenance. It may have been commissioned by one of Moore's early patrons, such as Sir James Montgomery, whom the artist first encountered through his aunt, who was his housekeeper um, at the whim, Montgomery's seat in Pibbleshire, so not too far from um, Needpass Castle. Another potential answer may lie within the archives of the Earls of Wims and March, owners of the castle today, and whose collection included at some point near contemporary paintings of Dunbar and Roslyn Castle by Moore. And I've actually been in touch with a current descendant of the family who was very interested to uh, try and bring the, the paintings together because they still have a, a painting uh, of Roslyn Castle in their collection. So that would be really uh, rather interesting to do. What I do know is that the painting is the earliest depiction that I'm aware of, uh, of Needpass Castle, uh, which is a rare example of a fortified tower house going back to the 12th century. Um, nestled on the his side above the river Tweed near Pibbles, with sweeping views across forest clad hills and rolling countryside, it's exactly the kind of building that from the 1770s onwards would become prominent feature in Traveller's account. Moore was not the only artist starting to focus on local beauty spots, and the university has in its collection other examples of this early interest in the, passion, in the nation's past that first started in books, prints, and drawings. And here I've just gathered um, 
a few uh, on the screen um, that illustrate um, what Moro's contemporaries were up to, um, to put the painting in context. Um, so you can see on the left side of your screen, um, a painting by Charles Cordiner of Boswell Castle, um, another kind of um, scenic spot, um, which is dated from 1765, and underneath uh, a view of Glasgow Cathedral uh, from the 1750s that was engraved by Robert Paul. Both were students at the Files Academy of Art in Glasgow, which preceded the Royal Academy by a, royal, by a couple of decades. Um, and they were encouraged by the Files brothers who founded the Academy and their patrons um, to cater for the growing demand for views of local site, um, which um, came out of their awareness of the rising interest in Scotland as a terrain of inquiry. Um, and both Cordiner and Paul were seeking appropriate subject matter among the city's landmark and its surrounding, and were focusing on local landscape over ideal as one, which was a new sort of attitude among Scottish artists at the time. So the engraving of Glasgow Cathedral, the oldest cathedral in mainland Scotland, is among the earliest views of Glasgow ever made, for example. And Gordina's view of Boswell Castle, which according to Thomas Pennant, uh, in his account uh, of Scotland is beautifully seated on the banks of the Clyde, anticipates a proliferation of words and image that celebrated uh, Scotland's landscape in the wakes of uh, Pennant's tour. On the other side, we have two artists um, who are from the east of Scotland as opposed to the west of Scotland. We've got the taking down of the nether bow by Jan Runciman in the top right corner. And in the bottom right corner, we have a view of the castle of Ellen Stalker by Sir John Clark, Clark of Pinnacook. Runciman um, knew Moore and was involved with the Trustees Academy in Edinburgh as well. And his etching captures a historic Edinburgh landmark as it's being demolished. Once the principal gateway into the city, controlling the flow of trade and standing at the meeting point of three major arteries, um, the nether bow was being cleared away in the interest of better circulation. So um, John Runciman's um, etching shows an interest in the past and trying to preserve it, as well as showing progress. Um, as for Clark of Eldin, he was an amateur etcher and draftsman with an interest in landscape, who made a speciality of coastal scenes, notably of historic waterside fortress, such as Ellen Stalker, as part of a wider interest in the naval and military history of Scotland. So together with Jacob Moore and Charles Stewart, these artists were very much engaged with contemporary debates around art and culture and shared a common patriotic aim that matched the upsurge of interest in Scottish culture, heritage and history, and in the development of a new national identity following the end of the Jacobite threat. <clears throat> In many ways, one could argue they anticipated the impending fame of Scotland's scenery that would, by the end of the century, feature strongly on the walls of public art exhibitions, in travel writing, and in literature. And the existence of such work suggests business acumen as well, as antiquarian tours of Scotland were becoming just a thing, and subject matters such as natural wonders, picturesque ruins, and historical buildings were born to be well to be well received and to potentially generate commissions, either for paintings or for illustrations. Now, if we focus closer on the painting, uh, Moore has used a fluid handling of paint to depict lush vegetation and a catch of huge fish. And you can see the detail blown up that shows you that catch of fish, which conveys with great spontaneity the richness and the splendor of the river Tweed. Now, this too is a theme often picked up by contemporary travelers' account, who comment on the abundance of game and fish they encountered and show an interest in traditional fishing methods, among others. So details such as a catch of fish or the presence of a fisherman in a landscape would later become a traditional addition to many landscapes depicting Scotland. And you could consider that it's just a way of introducing anecdotal interest to a painting. But if we turn to archive and special collections again, uh, there is one particular publication um, that brings an interesting angle to the presence of such a catch in Moore's painting. Um, it's Thomas Thornton, a sporting tour through the northern parts of England and great parts of the highlands of Scotland. Thornton, who studied at the University of Glasgow in the late 1760s, was an eccentric Yorkshire sportsman and a bon viveur. 
He spent a fortune on organizing an elaborate angling and chuti tour of the Kangons in 1784. Having chartered a boat for himself, his party, dogs, hawks, and guns, he organized for supplies to be sent by road ahead of time. It really was quite an enterprise. Um, he had floored tents complete with doors and stoves that allowed him to entertain his visitors with lavish dinners as well. And he had um, an artist among his party, um, the animal painter and sculptor George Garrard, whose sketches were later used to illustrate Thornton's account of his tour. And this is one of those that you can see on your screen there, which is showing fishermen on the side uh, of a loch. So if we bring together the painting and this publication, it allows us to hint at the future popularity of Scottish country sports associated with the Victorian era. And it shows just how early it started. All the potentials for interpretations include uh, Midpass Castle itself. It has a rich history dating back to the 13th century and was visited by various personalities over the last eight centuries from American of Scots who visited apparently in 1563 to the Edinburgh historian and philosopher Robert Ferguson, who lived there at the turn of the century and counted among his guests Sir Walter Scott and William and Dorothy Woodworth in 1803. Its connection to Scottish culture goes beyond history, um, and you can see that I've included an illustration of uh, the Maid of Netpath, uh, which was produced by uh, Heath. Oh, and the date is wrong. It's not circa 1770, it's from the 1830s, but never mind. Um, <coughs> the, maid, the Maid of Needpass celebrates the story of Jean Douglas, youngest daughter of William Douglas, Earl of March, who was forbidden to marry the man she loved as he was considered below her station. And this is a story that was taken up by Scott, who wrote a poem about it. And it's still famous today, there are songs uh, around the Maid of Needpass as well. Further avenues um, include descriptions of Nidbas Castle in subsequent, subsequent literature and in prints, drawings, and paintings up to 1832. As I mentioned before, this is the earliest view I'm aware of. And the next view I have come across so far, because, uh, before Nidbas Castle be be becomes a favorite subject for artists in the 19th century, is an aqua tint after a drawing by George Walker, which is dated 1793, for which there is an impression in the King's topographical um, collection at the British Library. And I have a picture somewhere, but I couldn't put my hand on it. So you'll have to forgive me for not being able to show it to you. And instead, I thought I would just include, if you can see it on your screen, it's little, um, um, it's not, um, it's a little difficult to read, but um, Turner is among the artists who visited the castle during the 19th century. And he did several um, sketches of it um, in a sketchbook that is now kept um, in Tate Britain. And these dates from his visit of uh, 1834. I think I've spent enough time taking you down the different paths that we could take uh, with this painting. Uh, but if you have any other ideas around further stories we could tell or explore around the painting, just let me know at the end. Um, and now I will just turn to John Knox and his view of Montaigne's and the Wooden Bridge executed roughly uh, 50 years after uh, Jacob Moore uh, painted Nidbas Castle. We know little of Knox's formation as an artist. We know he was born in Paisley in 1776, that he was the son of a yarn merchant and that he moved to Glasgow at age 12. Just like Jacob Moore, we know that he initially achieved recognition as a painter of scenery for this theater and that he went on to consolidate his reputation through the production of ambitious large-scale panoramas of Glasgow and its surrounding areas between 1808 and 1812. Um, and I've put on the screen here, um, later um, versions of those uh, panoramas taken from Ben Lomond, which are dated from the 1830s and were executed uh, for patrons. And although they are 150 uh, centimeters long, they are nothing like the original panoramas that uh, Knox uh, painted at, um, around um, 1810, but they do give us an idea of, of what they would have looked like. And those um, two here are now on display at Calvin Grove, 
um, the truly ambitious and original, and they aimed to convey an idea of the magnitude and extent of the view from the top of Ben Lomond, a view often commented upon in contemporary literature, but never captured on canvas in such a way before. The young artist must have known that if it met with approval, it would undoubtedly contribute to cement his reputation as a landscape painter. Um, what's particularly interesting is that they're quite accurate topographically, um, and they describe the hills surrounding Bell Lomond um, very well. And they also include details such as tourists having a picnic, um, and you can see that on the top bottom painting in the left right corner. Um, and also um, an artist with a last large sketchbook and that is in the top um, painting southwestern view from Loch Lomond on, on top of the hill to um, the left. Um, and it also represents um, a number of uh, locals. There is a shepherd there with um, <clears throat> its flock and details. Uh, along the lines. So the painting brings together a close observation of na nature with an analysis of the type of person who would venture to the summit of a mountain as described in contemporary travel accounts. Perhaps more than any other works produced at that time, it is a celebration of Scotland's vast landscape and of its newfound popularity with tourists and native alike, capturing with um, what artists like to call an honest brush aiming to appear as following nature closely, a landscape that would be instantly recognizable as well as immersive. Now, Nock's choice of subject matter can also be read as a response to the challenges posed in books during his youth around the difficulties presented to the adepts of the picturesque by the wilderness and vastness of sites such as Loch Lomond, about which they would write, and there are many, many quotes available, and, and they all convey the same sort of thing. And here I quote just one. Nature has here performed her operation on so grand a scale that it is far beyond the power of art to convey any idea of their magnitude or extent. Encouraged by the success of these uh, panoramic views taken from Ben Lumen, Knox then transferred his attention to the execution of smaller scale paintings of majestic west coast and highland landscapes for a domestic setting to which mountains and wooden bridge in the Trossachs belong. Um, and I've included here the panoramic view as a panorama, just so that you, you can uh, get a better sense of it, um, as well as two of the best uh, known paintings of the Trossachs by um, John Knox, which feature Lord Catherine. And here again, you can see that rather than a romantic or picturesque interpretation of the landscape, Knox offers the viewer a topographically correct, accurately observed rendering of the beauty spots that had reached unprecedented fame relatively recently at the time they were painted, which is around 1815, thanks to the success of Sir Walter Scott's poem and novel, The Lady of the Lake, which was first published in 1810. And again, with his use of Loch Catherine, Knox gives us a modern landscape where tourists cohabit with local inhabitants. That brings to life the many written description of the loch published by his contemporaries in their accounts of their visit. <clears throat> Mountain with a Wooden Bridge is a welcome addition to this group of works in public collection for a number of reasons. First, it effectively doubles the Hunterian's representation of the artist. As prior to this acquisition, the Hunterian owned only one work by John Knox, which you saw at the beginning of the presentation. It's that view of the Nelson Monument in Glasgow Green being struck by lightning. Second, it is likely to be a depiction of the wooden bridge Knox painted several versions of and exhibited between 1813 and the late 1820s. Only one version seems to have survived, which last appeared on the market back in the 1980s, and I don't think it's this particular uh, version, which means that it's potentially representing one of Knox's first attempt at capturing the wilderness and majesty of the Trossachs prior to the works that are now in Glasgow Life and the National Gallery of Scotland, those two views of Lord Catherine we've just looked at. This in itself is interesting for anyone wanting to understand Knox's development as an artist better, particularly if we take into account that in the late 1800s and early 1810s, Knox was still very much at the beginning of his career and involved with theater scenery. <coughs> and in many ways, Montaigne's with a wooden bridge, arrangement of Montaigne's tree, bridge and spotlight figures is reminiscent of a stage set, which kind of goes with the idea that this would be an early work by Knox. <clears throat> the difficulty with Knox, of course, is that he very rarely dated his work, so we've got to try and work out what was painted when and use stylistic differences to, to do that. 
I think it also allows the Hentayan to highlight Knox Saviness as a Regency early Victorian artist who recognized the rise in popularity of images of Scotland, a point that is expanded upon in Old Ways New Road Travel in Scotland. Um, and finally, just like Jacob Moore's painting, it reflects the Hunterian's collection policy around late 18th and early 19th century Scottish works of art, which has for the last 15 years been supported by several successful grant applications to the Art Fund and the National Fund for Acquisitions. And I will stop here and um, thank you for listening. And I'm very happy to take questions if you have any.